Half a day, and welcome to the Guam Congress building. The Committee on Justice is now called to order. Today's Friday, July 16, 2021, and the time is 5.05 p.m. We're here today for a confirmation hearing for the appointment of Alberto E. Tolentino, Esquire, to serve as judge of the Superior Court of Guam. Notices for this hybrid public hearing were disseminated via email to all senators and all main media broadcasting outlets on Friday, July 9th, and again on Wednesday, July 14th, 2021. The notice was also published in the Guam Daily Post on Wednesday, on Tuesday, July 6th, and Friday, July 9th, and again on Wednesday, July 14th. This, this host, the host of our hybrid public hearing is the legislature's AV staff and my committee staff, and they will mute all Zoom participants until called upon by the chair. Individuals testifying, please state your name before speaking for the record keeping purposes. Those participating on Zoom, please ensure that your video is on while you are testifying. We will hear testimony from those who have signed up to testify, either in person or by Zoom. And we will allow senators to ask questions of each of the panels prior to dismissing that panel. After all the testimony, we will allow the nominee, Mr. Alberto E. Talentino, to also present testimony. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of my colleagues tonight, beginning with Senator Tello Taitukui, Senator Joanne Brown, and Senator James Moreland. And Senator Anthony Adda. Thank you, colleagues. Welcome, Attorney Tolentino, and congratulations again on your uh, appointment to serve as judge of the Superior Court of Guam. We're happy to welcome your family here as well and in the session, uh, public hearing room with us. Thank you. And welcome also to those who are here and out in the hall and on Zoom who are here to provide testimony. The current statutes regarding nominations, appointment, eligibility, and tenure of judges is in section 3109 of chapter three, title seven of the Guam Code annotated. It provides that Imagalahan Guahan, with the advice and consent of Elizabeth and Guahan, shall appoint a qualified person subject to the advice and consent of Elizabeth and Guahan to any vacancy occurring in either the Supreme Court or the Superior Court of Guam. The Judicial Council and the Guam Bar Association may each submit a list of qualified nominees for Imagat Lahan Guahan's consideration. The Chief Justice and each Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of Guam shall be a United States citizen, a bona fide resident of Guam for at least five years, and shall have been in active practice of law on Guam for a period of at least 10 years before said nomination. The presiding judge and each other judge of the Superior Court of Guam shall be a United States citizen, a bona fide resident of Guam for at least five years, and shall be in the active practice of law on Guam for a period of seven years before said nomination. No judge shall, during the term of office, engage in the private practice of law. No judge shall, during the term of office, run for or hold any other office or position or profit under the United States, any state, Guam, or any other political subdivision of the United States. For the record, Written testimony has been support in, uh, submitted in support of the, the nomination by the Chief Justice F. Philip Carbadito, Philip Tidinko, Esquire, Marie Evaristo, Deborah E. Fisher, Esquire, Michael J. Gatewood, Esquire, Loretta Gutierrez Long, Esquire, Terence A. Long, Esquire, 
James M. Maher, Esquire, Christopher P. Somera, Edward S. Tovis, Retired Marshal of the Courts, Judiciary of Guam, Kenneth Orcutt, Esquire, R. Happy Rons, Esquire, Joseph McDonald, Esquire, Seth Foreman, Esquire, Marianne Wolaschuk, Esquire, James Martinez, Alejandria Pangilinan, and Danilo M. Rapadas, Esquire. All of, all of the written testimony in this list is in support. We'll now accept uh, testimony from those who are present, beginning with Cynthia Akubi, attorney. Please proceed. Buenas and half a day, Speaker Terlahi, and members of the Committee on Health, Land, Justice, and Culture. As indicated a minute ago, my name is Cynthia V. Akubi, and I'm a private practitioner licensed to practice law in all local courts of Guam and with the Federal District Court of Guam. I am pleased to provide my written testimony in support of the confirmation of Alberto E. Tolentino for the position as judge of the Superior Court of Guam. I have known attorney Tolentino, who we fondly refer to as Berto, for over four decades. We have known each other through family and social friendships and relationships, and also as high school teammates when we played on the same tennis team for our schools, Father Duenas and the Academy of Our Lady of Guam. On a side note, I was always impressed with attorney Tolentino's tennis skills because he played like one of my favorite former tennis stars, Jimmy Connors, and he used the same racket as Jimmy Connors, the T2000, like me. Moving on, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, Attorney Tolentino during the course of his legal career. We worked on criminal cases when he served as a prosecutor with the Attorney General's office, and on civil cases when he was a private practitioner with the law firm of Cabot Mantinonia. While working on cases together, Attorney Tolentino was a tenacious advocate for his clients and well prepared when litigating his cases. I've also appeared before his court during his eight-year term when he served as magistrate judge with the Superior Court of Guam. More recently, I have and continue to work with attorney Tolentino, who is ethics counsel, while serving as a member of the investigative panel of the Guam Bar Ethics Committee. Having worked on different areas of the law with attorney Tolentino, it is clear to me that he possesses all the qualities and attributes to serve as judge for the Superior Court of Guam. Attorney Tolentino is a highly intelligent, competent, and methodical individual. He possesses strong analytical legal skills, is attentive to the facts of a case, and is well, and is pre well prepared when presenting his case, and is, has the ability to make sound and practical decisions. While service, serving as magistrate judge, he issued numerous decisions based on the law. He was also very respectful and open-minded when he conducted his hearings, was able to listen to both sides of a situation prior to making a fair and impartial, impartial decision when resolving a dispute. As ethics counsel, attorney Tolentino has always been very diligent in his work. He's conducted all the necessary legal research and is prepared when presenting information to our committee in order to make an informed decision concerning the licensure of our Guam attorneys. On a personal note, Berto possesses qualities of honesty, integrity, and leadership while upholding strong ethical standards. He is a hardworking and conscientious individual who's committed to doing the right thing and making the best decision based on the facts and the law. I am confident that he will make a valuable asset to our local court and to the community of Guam, and I fully support his confirmation as judge for the Superior Court of Guam. If you have any questions concerning this information, please do not hesitate to contact me, and thank you again for the opportunity to present this testimony on behalf of judicial nominee Alberto E. Tolentino for the Superior Court of Guam. This is Massey, Attorney Ekibi. When I go to virtual, Attorney Rodney Jacob. Please proceed. 
thank you, Speaker Terlahi, um, senators and, and distinguished guests uh, from our island that are participating in this hearing. I'm Rodney Jacob. Um, I'd like to first say that I endorse everything that Attorney Akubi just said about uh, Judge Nominee Tolentino. Having been a member of the bar and actively involved in the federal and local judiciary since 1995, I cannot stress how critical Judge Nominee Tolentino's confirmation will be to our community. Judge Nominee Tolentino is an appropriate choice for such an important position because he is focused on service to our people and understands that the law must work for our community. He believes in the rule of law and will be strict to follow the law. He has a lot of energy to make things better and is exacting when he analyzes a problem. He understands that being a judge is not whether a litigant wins or not. Someone has to win and someone has to lose in most cases. But it's about whether the judge has listened, work hard in understanding the complexity of a problem, and then gives every side the opportunity to be heard. This is giving people a fair shake. And he has these qualities that will translate into a good judge. Also, given that our island community is small, I know that Judge Nominee Tolentino will be able to call balls and strikes no matter what his decision may be. Judge Nominee Tolentino will be a strong asset to the judiciary of Guam. He's a well-seasoned jurist who served as a magistrate judge for many years. He's also served as a prosecutor in our attorney general's office and as ethics prosecutor as well as attorney of QB uh, indicated. And it's because of this experience that he'll be immediately able to offer a helping hand to alleviate an already overburdened bench, which has been significantly impacted by the pandemic. I had the privilege of serving with Judge Nominee Tolentino in my capacity as the chairman of the investigative panel for the Guam Bar Association's Ethics Committee. He worked on and assisted the committee in resolving multiple matters, showing his efficiency, which indicated to me how he will serve efficiently and well on the bench. He inherited a case of 74 cases in 2018, accumulated many more over the last three years. And when my term ended last month, um, there were only 16 uh, cases pending. But perhaps most importantly, he is humble, he's smart, and he treats everyone with the highest dignity. And after all, these are the most essential ingredients of who we want to dispense justice for our community. On top of that, he'll serve as a role model to lawyers and others in our community that rely on the courts for justice and fairness. He'll be a role model to those working every day to do the right thing. He'll never forget that a public servant is put into office to improve the lives of those he serves. He knows that only through hard work, humility, and conscientiousness can one fulfill the demands of a judicial officer. He'll be an important addition to the bench as he reflects important parts of our community. And most of all, he'll work hard for our people and the people whose rights he will adjudicate with humility and grace. So it's for these reasons and many more that I recommend that Judge Nominee Tolentino be confirmed as the next judge of the Superior Court as soon as this body is able. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Attorney Jacob. We'll now go to Peter Santos, Attorney. Buenas and half a day, uh, Senor Speakers and Hamzuni Pumalu na Honorable Senador and Senadoras, Gualsi Pete Santos. Ungan Magai Todu, Hafa Masangan, Podesti Kilis Dano, si Senor Alberto Tolentino. Gual Tio Goftungo Stina Tauto, Timatuzo Magi, Pabe Alok na who support Tagui, Lo Matuzo Magi. Pabe alok na hu sen sapota, hu gof sapota, hu sapota ni dururu. Lau, hafa na bay sangan edzo sa tiu gof tungo sti na tau tau. 
sa puri haftay maano hana fanyentizo anay pago matujo tatigig tanota. Gua un sinangan gifino English. You may not remember what you talked about, but you will always remember how someone made you feel. Pues put edzo sa anay pago matujo masanganyo. Stabadzo hulugi Attorney General's office masanganyo aday sa kalan rectujo na tauto. Ang ginpon hanaw papa, japon fanagwi, na siguro na todo listo. Pues gimagay, if inene na nabiyay na ufana si Judge Tolentino ginatempo sa magistrate judge, hanafan yan tiyo na maulika agwi na tauto. Pues, and I'm not done todo i hearing siya. Like niya, let's go off the record. Pues a contusio. Ja sigun i kuntus mami, tio hasu hafa i kuntus mami. Lo sigun i kuntus mami, hana fanyan tio na maulik istina tau tau, maulik kurason nya, maulik intinson nya. Ja hagof nu seset bi i tau tau guam. Pues, gi despues kadau maliam gi masya manu guatu. Gi home depot pat gi payless. Ha agangu ja kuntusio, ay ti guau ma agangwe. Pues, hana anuk na gof humit di na tau-tau lokwe. Sa tia popolo na giza gisan hilo, za gaw gisan papa. At suka, tat kilonya gwe kini gwao. Ha popolo ju na man hita, man parewe na tau-tau. Pues, ane u atanis di na tau-tau, u hasu, hafa gagi gi kurasonya, hana fanyantio na Dinansi gi na klasin tau-tau po fatatsong gi bangko gi Superior Court of Guam. Pues enawa pa ba'y sangyan pa ko na po ngi sa puri haftay manu huli'i gi halam kurason niya dyan haftay manu hanafan yan tiyo kumu tau-tau dyo ay ti no magas gwi dya gagyo gi sa papa. Hanafan yan tiyo na tau-tau dyo dyan man parewe todos. Si Diyos Masi. Si Diyos Masi. Attorney Santos. Attorney Deborah Fisher. Buenas and happy day, Speaker Talahi and the committee. Thank you for providing this opportunity to submit written testimony for the committee's consideration of Attorney Alberto E. Talentino for appointment as a judge of the Superior Court. It has been with a great pleasure that I have had the opportunity to work closely with Attorney Tolentino during his tenure as the Supreme Court Ethics Prosecutor while I was a member of the investigatory panel. Attorney Tolentino reviewed and investigated complaints as well as researched and dra drafted reports that were presented to the investigatory panel. Attorney Tolentino was able to cover a lot of material with well-reasoned written work Product. Additionally, he was always professional, courteous, and thoughtful. Sometimes not everyone on the investigatory panel agreed with some point or other. In these situations, Attorney Talentino unfailingly listened, considered, and responded. He demonstrated not only his wide and deep knowledge of legal issues and facts, but his ability to consider all points in a reasoned and thorough way. In my 27-year legal career, I spent approximately nine years working in trial courts in various roles as a court attorney or law clerk. It has been my experience both within the courts and as an advocate appearing before the courts that great judges have the ability to assess voluminous paper make timely, well-considered decisions, and appropriately address the public, especially unrepresented litigants, with empathy and courtesy. From my experience in working with Attorney Talentino, like all great judges, I have had the honor of serving. I have seen that he upholds the highest standards, not only of legal knowledge and reasoning, issue spotting, decision making, but he possesses the ultimate, a calm and courteous judicial demeanor. 
Attorney Alberto E. Tolentino has my full and unconditional support to be appointed a judge of the Superior Court of Guam. Thank you again for providing this opportunity and for the committee's wise consideration to place Attorney Tolentino onto the Superior Court of Guam. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Fisher. Attorney Ari Anita Ariola. Thank you. Half a day, Honorable Speaker Terlahi and members of the committee on health, land, justice, and culture. I submit this testimony in support of Alberto Tino, not simply for myself, but for members of my firm, Jay Ariola, Bucky Brennan, and Nicole Cruz. I strongly support the appointment of Alberto Tolentino to the vac vacancy on the Superior Court of Guam. I have known Berto for over 30 years and in that time have come to know him well and respect him very much. His intellect is keen. His breadth of knowledge, particularly legal knowledge, is impressive and his commitment to service deep. I cannot think of a better combination of qualities for a superior court judge. When Berto was a prosecutor at the Attorney General's office, I watched him in court and saw how he was highly regarded by other attorneys and by judges. He was always well prepared, knowledgeable about his cases, and he represented the government and the people of Guam very effectively. I also knew Berto when he was the ethics prosecutor. I have represented lawyers who have been accused of ethical violations and I have worked with and sometimes fought against Berto to resolve those cases. It is not easy to be an ethics prosecutor in a place as small as Guam. You are not well liked and you are not popular. But Berto has a great deal of integrity. He inspired much respect and he has a deep sense of fairness. If any one of my clients got in trouble or had legal issues, I would want them to appear before him. I then practiced before Berto when he was a magistrate judge at the court. He worked hard to prepare for his hearings. He fairly applied the law to all sides. He, was an, he has an eth excellent work ethic, and he has a balanced approach to decision making. He also has a wonderful judicial temperament. Wise, calm, and inspiring of confidence that a person will get a fair shake in front of him. He was always courteous and professional, and he inspired others in the courtroom to be the same. In that respect, he reminds me very much of former Judge Joaquin Manabusin Jr. Many lawyers have a combination of educational, education and professional qualifications that are suitable for a judgeship. But we expect our judges to meet very high standards. Berto has some big shoes to fill. He would be filling a vacancy left by the Honorable Anita Sicola, one of the hardest working, fairest, and best judges we have ever had on the Superior Court. Alberto Tolentino's combination of character, intelligence, diligence, and temperament suit him perfectly to meet those standards and to become an outstanding judge of the Superior Court of Guam. Thank you very much for the opportunity to submit this testimony. Thank you very much, Attorney Ariola. We have... Um, Virtually, Attorney Jocelyn Roden. Please proceed. Thank you, Speaker Tulahi. I'm sorry, Attorney. If I could uh, dismiss this panel, let me ask my colleagues if there are any questions for this panel. Senator Taitigui, Senator Brown, Senator Moylan, Senator Ada. All right. Thank you again, and you may be dismissed. Sizu Ms. Rodin, you may proceed. Thank you, Speaker Tulahi. Good evening, Afadeh. It is a privilege for me to testify for 
an old friend and a former co-worker. I'm currently a lawyer at Public Defender Service Corporation. Well, not at 5.29 p.m. at any rate, but I've known Alberto Tolentino through similar friends and family in a social and working um, environment since 1992. I had the privilege of working with him at the Attorney General's office as a young prosecutor together with Alicia Limtiaco. They were both my supervisor in, my, in the misdemeanor unit that I was in. And they both trained me, but Alberto Tolentino was more in charge for the arduous weekend overcharging of police reports. That rigor, patience, diligence, was instilled in all of us, but I must say he was very meticulous, hardworking, fair. We didn't charge everyone. And he really looked over the cases and listened to the alleged victims. I can't say more than what has already been said and, and probably way more articulate than me. But I can say that watching him over the years with pride as a friend, as a lawyer, and as an adversary, as a defense lawyer, public defender. I must say he has strong patience and calmness, especially as the magistrate judge, over heated arguments between parties. And I think that is his greatest strength, that calmness and patience to hear both sides. So I strongly support um, his nomination and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on his behalf. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Attorney Rodit. Attorney Hemlani, virtual. Thank you, Senator Terlahi. Uh, for this opportunity to speak in support of Alberto Tolentino's nomination as judge of the Superior Court of Guam. As an attorney, I have appeared before Alberto, or Berto as we all fondly call him, uh, when he served as a magistrate judge of the Superior Court. Uh, my feeling is that he's already demonstrated that his legal skills, integrity, and temperament will be an asset to the judiciary. Alberto has a very keen legal mind and intelligence wrapped in a humble demeanor which results in an excellent judicial temperament. Not only does he have proven experience analyzing complicated legal issues and applying the law appropriately, Alberto is a kind person and he treats people with dignity. He has a good sense of humor and an easygoing personality that I've seen him use effectively to diffuse tense situations. As vice president of the Guam Bar Association, I've witnessed Alberto's hard work and integrity while working and serving as our ethics prosecutor, if you heard testimony to that. I know that there are other attorneys, including myself, that are sorry we'll be losing him in that position, which tells you how well-liked Alberto is and how he has the respect of his colleagues. I thank you for this opportunity and I wholeheartedly support Alberto Tolentino's nomination. I encourage you and all the senators of the Guam legislature to confirm him as judge of the Superior Court. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Hemlani. Attorney Jackie Terlahi, also virtual. Hafade, Senator, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak on behalf of judicial nominee Alberto Tolentino. Uh, as uh, Attorney Roden said, I can't possibly say nicer things about Berto than the many people who have spoken today. What I can tell you is that the experience that I've had with Berto is, is exactly as everyone has testified to today, that he is conscientious, he's responsible, um, he is competent, and he has a love for the law. A love, I think, that is extremely important to see in a judicial officer. Why? Because justice is extremely important um, for those who appear in the Superior Court of Guam. And so I ask senators to accept this testimony and the testimony of all of those who have appeared today um, in support of our judicial nominee, Berto Tolentino. Thank you for the opportunity. 
Thank you, Attorney Terlahu, President of the Guam Bar Association. Attorney McDonald, virtual. Attorney Joseph McDonald. Attorney Marianne Wolaschuk. Please proceed. Madam Speaker and committee members, my name is Marianne Wallace-Chuck and I'm a lawyer here on Guam. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak in support of Alberto Tolentino. I have submitted written testimony with a glowing recommendation for Berto. I just wanted to briefly express my support today publicly in person or as close to in person as we can get in these times. For all the reasons that are set forth in my written testimony, I hope that you will confirm Mr. Tolentino as Superior Court Judge. He is eminently qualified, he has the necessary temperament, and he will do an excellent job. Thank you so much. Thank you, Attorney Walashek. Now hear from Attorney Weisenberger. Dear Speaker Terlahi and members of the Committee on Health, Land, Justice, and Culture, Boynus and Hafaday, I wholeheartedly support the appointment of Alberto E. Tolentino to become a judge of the Superior Court of Guam. I have known Mr. Tolentino for more than 25 years as a friend, a co-worker, and a fellow attorney in our community. Mr. Tolentino has a very good reputation, as we've heard, in the legal community on Guam. The reason I believe for the good reputation of Mr. Tolentino is that he is, a, is recognized as a hardworking and good lawyer, a good person, and a person to be trusted. He is well qualified to be a judge. The judiciary of Guam and the community of Guam will be well served by his appointment to serve as a judge. Please confirm Alberto E. Tolentino to be a judge of the Superior Court of Guam. Thank you very much. Thank you, Attorney Weisenberger. Attorney Stephen Hattori. Good evening, uh, Madam Speaker, committee members. I've known uh, Berto for as long as I've been practicing law on Guam. I've observed him as a trial attorney when he was a prosecutor. I have worked with him on the Ethics Investigatory Committee prior to him becoming a magistrate judge. I have appeared before him countless times when he was our sole uh, magistrate judge. Based upon the many years of experience, I can fully support his nomination to be the next judge of the Superior Court. Berto has the judicial temperament to handle this incredibly stressful position. Time and time again, when we worked together years ago on the Guam Bar Ethics Committee, he was both zealous and fair. It's tough work prosecuting ethical claims against your colleagues, yet he managed to do so without alienating the entire bar. He still has many friends uh, who are attorneys, despite the fact that he was uh, prosecuting many of us. This speaks to his calm and dispassionate demeanor. He prosecuted claims not out of malice, but out of merit. And whether he was a prosecutor handling complex homicide cases, an ethics prosecutor investigating ethical complaints, or a magistrate judge determining whether or not a client can stay out of jail, Berto was diligent, fair, and just. As a judicial nominee, he possesses a great range of experience that bodes well for his future as a judge. Above all else, Berto has been a tremendous public servant. At this time, I would like to provide my unwavering and unequivocal support for his nomination. 
and thank you for the time and the opportunity to provide testimony in support of the appointment of Alberto Tolentino to serve as a judge of the Superior Court of Guam. Thank you. Sito Smasi, Attorney Hattori. If we could go virtual to Attorney Lisa Lorick. Please proceed. Thank you. Good evening, Senators, and thank you to Senator Terlahi and the Committee on Health, Land, Justice, and Culture for letting us speak. Um, I was, I, I guess I'm still a member of the Guam Bar. It's been about 10 years now. I worked with uh, Judge Tolentino for about nine years. He was the first judge I ever got to appear before for about the first six months of the beginning of my law career. And I learned so much just from being in his hearings and um, seeing the way he practiced and what he wanted us to present to him. So, you know, I, I owe him the beginnings of my actual learning experience on Guam. And I'm here to give my complete support to Judge Tolentino for confirmation of Superior Court of Guam judge. Um, he is basically everything I second, everything everybody has said about him being positive. In my experience in the courtroom with him, he is a role model. He was, he was my role model. Um, I don't know him personally. You know, I would see him in the halls and he would be friendly and acknowledge me, but I've never had, you know, a personal conversation with him. So everything is completely professional. He is extremely patient. <laughs> I, I've seen many situations that, a lot of people would not remain calm in. He has always been respectful. He does make his decisions based on the law, making sure that it's fairly applied. He has a great character to become a judge. Right now, I am inactive and I am actually in Oklahoma where I'm from. So I, I, have, <laughs> I won't be able to practice in front of him, which is a little disappointing. So I have no you know, reason other than I believe he will be a great judge. And I second everybody's comments about the ethics prosecutor. I was there for his predecessor. And um, when I found out he was going to be the ethics prosecutor, it was a huge relief that it would be somebody who could be fair and impartial. And you didn't have to worry about other motives. Um, I give my full and unconditional support for his confirmation. And I thank you for letting me speak. Thank you very much, Attorney Florick. Attorney Lorick, is there anyone of my colleagues who have questions for the virtual panel? If not, then um, we'll proceed. We have two more to testify. Uh, Attorney Espeldon. Thank you and good evening, Madam Speaker and members of the committee. My name is Carl Espaldon, and I am here today in my personal capacity to enthusiastically and unreservedly support the confirmation of Alberto Tolentino as judge of the Superior Court of Guam. I have known Berto for over 50 years as our respective parents, Drs. Ernesto and Leticia Espaldon, and Dr. Sinferoso and Mrs. Connie Tolentino were medical colleagues and close friends from the old GMH days back in the 1960s. Like many families in Guam, the Espaldon and Tolentino children essentially grew up together and consider each other family. As such, while I was growing up, Berto was like an older brother to me, looking out for me and his younger brother, Rossi Tolentino, attorney Tolentino there, making sure we were okay and trying valiantly, if not always successfully, to keep us from mischief. To this day, Berto still inquires about the well-being of me and my family, encourages and supports me in my personal and professional life, and is someone I know I can always count on for wise counsel and advice. The committee has and will no doubt hear positive testimony about the professional qualifications and attributes that support Berto's confirmation to sit as a judge of the Superior Court. I echo and join those who believe he is eminently qualified for the bench. It is my opinion that amongst most attorneys, Burrow is highly thought of and well-respected as a lawyer, a jurist, and a person. Through his previous positions as an assistant attorney general, 
to the de Chief Deputy Attorney General, to his tenure as Magistrate Judge and his current position as, as Ethics Prosecutor, Berto has distinguished himself as a versatile, fair, talented, and hardworking attorney who has dedicated the majority of his career and his life to public service and the public good. Madam Speaker, I have testified in front of this body before, expressing to you and your colleagues my desire and my hope that Guam's best and brightest be elevated to and assume the mantle of leadership and responsibility at this island's highest levels. In my opinion, Alberto Tolentino fits the bill. He has a proven record of achievement and exemplary service to the people of Guam and the sincere desire to contribute further as a member of the bench. I know he will comport himself admirably if given the opportunity to serve, and this island and our judicial system will be the better for it. Finally, apart from his distinguished career and his professional achievements and attributes, Berto stands out for me for the type of person he is. Those of us who know Berto well know a warm, smart, kind, and funny man with a great sense of humor. We also know him as a man of integrity and honor. He is also a family man, a loving husband, father, son, and brother. Some of my most vivid memories that illustrate the kind of person he is were again during the days growing up together. Berto had a sister, Abby, a few years younger, who was born with physical and developmental disability, disabilities that required constant care and attention. While the whole family loved and cared for Abby throughout her life, there was always a different and special bond between Alberto and Abby. He was always so patient and tender with her. He was the one who made her laugh, who comforted her when she was having a rough time, and who took her on the nighttime drives that she enjoyed so much. And he did all this willingly and lovingly throughout her life. That is the essence of the Berto that I know, a truly good, compassionate, and caring human being. I ask that you com confirm Berto to the Superior Court bench, and I thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you very much, Attorney Espaldon. We now have Attorney Sinforoso Talentino. Madam Speaker and members of the committee, on behalf of my mom, Connie Tolentino, and the rest of the clan of the Tolentinos here on Guam and in the States, we would like you to know that we are deeply humbled and honored by the fact that Alberto has been called upon again to serve the island as a member of the judiciary. A lot of things you'll hear about Alberto uh, from his colleagues and from others outline the man that he is, his credentials. He, he's, co he's come from good schools. He's, lived, he's made his career here in Guam as a public servant in prosecution, serving as magistrate, serving as the prosecutor in the ethics, um, on the ethics committee. That's been his whole life. His whole life has been about Guam and about serving the people of Guam. And that is a path that uh, has led him to this seat right now. The, you hear a lot about his character from other people. And I guess I only have one more thing to add when I think about today. And that is, if you want to know one thing about Alberto, you'll have to remember what my dad was all about, Dr. Sinferoso Tolentino. You need to know that Alberto is his exact likeness. Alberto is humble. Alberto never stood before in the spotlight. When he's asked to serve and do his duty, he does it, and he does it willingly and with vigor. And that's the same thing that my dad did. He 
represents us in such a formidable way and a com in such a compelling matter, manner that we're just so proud of where he is now. And I just, it, it, our family is just uh, so supportive of him and also ask your support in his appointment. Thank you very much, Attorney Tolentino, Rossi. And now we will hear from, well, if my colleagues have any questions for this panel, colleagues. All right, uh, thank you very much. You, you may stay or you may be dismissed. Um, and we will now hear from the nominee, Mr. Alberto Tolentino. I'm up now. Off a day and good afternoon or good evening, Madam Speaker, the honorable members of the committee of the 30, uh, 36 Guam Legislators Committee on Health, Land, Justice, and Culture. Allow me first to express my sincere appreciation for the committee's time and effort in going forward with this hearing on my nomination to be a judge of the Superior Court of Guam. I am truly humbled and honored to have been nominated by Governor Lou Leon Guerrero for this position and appreciate her trust and her confidence in my qualification and fitness for the office I have been offered. I am also encouraged and inspired by the people who have taken the time to come before you and testify uh, and value each of their perspectives on my nomination. And I also acknowledge and appreciate the presence and the, the support that the other people throughout the uh, uh, session hall have provided to me. Most importantly, though, I want to say that I am forever and truly grateful that God has blessed me with the ability and opportunities to confront, thrive, and persevere with what life has presented thus far. Now, we are all here to provide information, evaluate, and make judgments as to my qualifications, fitness, and temperament to sit on the bench of the Superior Court of Guam. And it is right and proper that you and collectively the people of Guam know about me, both personally and professionally. And my testimony this evening will, in some way, I hope, hopefully, provide you and the people of Guam with some brief insight into who I am as a person and what I would bring to the role of a jurist on the bench of the Superior Court of Guam. First things first, I am Clarissa's, Rossi's, Angela's, and Dominica's older brother. I am Dr. Tolentino's son, and I am Connie's oldest boy. I'm also Doris's husband. In fact, when our youngest child was born, I was Dor uh, Alberto Leon Guerrero. But uh, I stand before you as Alberto Tolentino. And what I would like to describe for you is a journey, my journey. A journey which brings me here before you is the journey of a son of Guam, of Chamorro and Filipino descent, who over the course of a lifetime has grown and matured into a person who has defined what it is is important in his life and how he has dealt with the expectations, accomplishments, and setbacks that all of us in one way or another have gone through. I am the product of a Catholic education from preschool to university, and through the practice of faith and experience, I believe I have developed a moral compass which has served me well and, and an outlook of my existence and relationship with God and with other people that has guided me since. Now, I graduated with a degree in biology with the thought of first pursuing a career like my father in medicine. However, I was convinced early on that maybe it was not meant to be. I didn't get the best grades in college, and I worked as an EKG tech, and the first patient I ever got to do by myself without my supervisor suffered a heart attack in front of me and died and I didn't think I can carry on 
trying to be uh, in the medical field. So I went back to San Francisco where I, lived, where I worked at the Bank of Guam and the uh, uh, Security Pacific National Bank, which now is Bank of America. First as a teller, then as a chief teller, then as a collections clerk, and ultimately as a corporate operations offer, officer with the Security Pacific National Bank. During that time, I was also a chauffeur uh, driving a limo, but that didn't last more than a month. Uh, it, it wasn't that, that cool. At the age of 26, I was blessed with the birth of my eldest daughter, Tamane, and my focus shifted to trying to ensure that I could give her the best of all that I could in terms of myself and her well-being. It was also during this time I had the opportunity to interact with corporate lawyers and deal with the legal requirements and sometimes nuanced services they provided to their corporate clients and was intrigued by that profession and culture. However, it was my brother Rossi who suggested that I pursue law school and that I could get a professional license in short order. Uh, he's younger than I am and he went through law school at a some small university, Georgetown, that doesn't really mean too much, but, you know, I looked up to him and it was inspiring to see him accomplish what he did, uh, knowing what, that, what he had to go through, through his health issues and so forth, and, and, and yet persevere through that and obtain his law degree. The only reason we're not practicing is he wants to be the boss and wants me to be the associate or the legal assistant. But, at his uh, encouragement, I took a chance, 30 years old, eight years removed from school, and a time when I had a steady job and income, I applied to and was accepted to the University of Pacific's McGeorge School of Law. Initially, I thought a law degree would help me in my dream of opening a restaurant, but during my first and second semester, I had the opportunity to come back home and clerk at the Attorney General's Office, Prosecution Division under the leadership of uh, the Chief Prosecutor, then Chief Prosecutor, and now the District Court of Guam Chief Judge Francis Tidinko Gatewood. And it was here that I sensed and saw in real life that the practice of law included more than just helping a client make or protect their money, but actually to provide a valuable service to the community in representing the people of Guam in criminal prosecutions, a representation that truly involved the protection of victims and of the community community and of the validation of the laws of Guam. Around this time, God blessed me again with the birth of my daughter, Kiana. And again, this happy event put a sense of urgency to engage in a meaningful career and provide for the care and well-being of my daughters. So in 1993, upon graduation, I took the position at the Attorney General's office, first as a misdemeanor attorney who handled lesser crimes and violations and then progressed to become the lead attorney for the Family Violence Cr uh, Criminal Sexual Conduct Unit. There I learned how to investigate, prosecute, and litigate some of the most serious crimes or instances of criminal conduct there are. In 1996, I joined the law firm of Cabot and Mantanonia and was given broad experience not only with dealing with actual clients, but lessons in civil litigation, transactional law, family court, criminal defense, drafting of wills, corporate documents like articles of incorporation and bulk sale transfers, leases, but I also gained an insight to the business side of the pra private practice of law. In 1998, Chief Justice Peter Seguenza was in need of a research attorney. His former attorney and now the staff attorney at the time, Lance Cantos, encouraged me to come on board, and it was there I had first-hand opportunity to see a jurist at work, how someone like Judge Seguenza analyzes the case, the research and, and writing skills that I learned at that particular time have served me even till today, or even to today. In, in 2000, Chief Justice Benjamin J. F. Cruz asked me to be the prosecuting counsel for the Guam Bar Ethics Committee. It was the first time that a full-time employee of the court would hold such a position prior to that. They were contracting out to private practitioners. 
but uh, given the volume of the cases and uh, uh, the conflicts that might have arose, they thought it better to keep it in-house at the court, and I was that first person to do that. Over the course of the next seven years, I investigated and prosecuted cases involving allegations of lawyer misconduct and the unauthorized practice of law, and as well as provided training to the members of the bar of the rules and procedures of the lawyer disciplinary system. At the request of Chief Justice F. Philip Carbolito, I was appointed to be a member of the subcommittee charged with the drafting and the adoption of the Guam rules of judicial disciplinary enforcement, and I became very familiar with the code of conduct of the, for judicial office, officers and of the disciplinary processes governing judicial ethics. It was around this time I also met my wife, Doris, and our two children, Brandon and Angela, and with the birth of our youngest daughter, Kristen, God again blessed my life and gave me renewed vigor and purpose as I continued my career. In 2007, I had the privilege to be the Chief Deputy Attorney General under then Attorney General Alicia Limtiaco, and in that capacity, I gained invaluable experience into the actual management of what essentially was the largest law firm on Guam, but also a modest gov government of Guam agency. Chief Justice Robert J. Torres at the time in 2009 selected me to be the first magistrate judge of the judiciary of Guam. The magistrate position had just been created and was envisioned to assist the other judges of general jurisdiction in handling their large caseloads, caseload and back, backlog by using a judicial officer of limited jurisdiction to handle preliminary criminal matters, post-judgment proceedings, small claims and traffic cases, and any other matters that arose. The Judicial Council appointed me reappointed me to the position after a re review and survey of people who appeared in front of me, either as a party or as a litigant or lawyer, and, and unanimously approved my reappointment. In November of 2017, my appointment expired. However, I was given the opportunity to continue to assist the judicial officers as a court referee in, in certain cases. In 2018, I was asked by Chief Justice Merriman, Justice uh, Kathy Merriman, Justice uh, Carbolito, and Justice Torres to revisit my role as the prosecuting and disciplinary counsel for the lawyer and the judicial disciplinary authorities, respectively. Because of my experience as the disciplinary counsel and my concern that there was a need to dispel the belief that there was something wrong with the disciplinary uh, system on uh, that we currently had at the time, and of my appreciation that the role and responsibility of the disciplinary authority is first and foremost to protect the public and the administration of justice from those lawyers and judicial officers who by their conduct demonstrate an inability or unwillingness to abide by the rules of professional conduct or the code of judicial conduct, and not merely a means as uh, to go after the punishment of lawyers who allegedly offended or allegedly violated the rules of uh, professional conduct. I accepted this offer without hesitation. Now, as I have looked back over my legal career, I came to the realization that there were specific patterns that arose and that crystallized my sense of who I am as a person and what and where I might make the most beneficial contribution. First, at every instance of legal employment, there was an opportunity to learn. The appetite to learn, always learn something new, has never waned in my life and continues even to this day. Second, the opportunity and desire to assist or participate in some manner seems to arise in many instances of my legal career. Whether it was to be the prosecuting counsel when Justice, Chief Justice Cruz asked me to, or recently by the current members of the Supreme Court, there was a need for someone to come in and fulfill the duties and responsibilities of the office. When Chief Justice Robert Torres appointed me to be a magistrate, there was a need to help and assist the judges of the Superior Court and their backlog of pending matters, and to provide, preside over sp uh, specific matters to help alleviate the demands upon the judicial officers there. 
Third, I realized that my father, you've heard a little bit from Rossi about Sinforoso Tolentino, who was at one time the only civilian orthopedic surgeon on Guam for the longest time, imparted a lasting lesson upon me. That lesson for me was the commitment to serve, as exemplified by the numerous hours he had spent either at the emergency room or the operating room at the GMH doing his rounds and at his clinics. I saw and experienced firsthand the commitment a person must have to make, must make in their chosen profession or calling to make a real difference in the lives of others and the sacrifices that come with that choice. But I also learned that merely doing a job can only go so far and that another mindset must also be present for true success. For the, from the love and caring my mother showed to me and my siblings, I learned that compassion, patience, and empathy is the driving force that makes your chosen profession that much more meaningful. I saw this with the care and love my mother showed for my sister Abby, who because of his, this love and care was with us for 51 years after her birth even though she had a severe disability and was not expected to last more than a few years. That experience and watching is what gifted me and my, my siblings empathy and humility and patience when dealing with people, other people, their issues or uh, other problems that arose. <clears throat> Finally, no person, judge, lawyer, senator, or any individual will ever be as complete a person they could be without hardship, adversity, criticism, difficulty, true or false allegations, or sacrifice, unless they also learn to deal with these issues. As Martin Luther King once said, the true measure of a man is not how he behaves in moments of comfort and convenience, but how he stands at times of controversy and challenges. I respectfully submit to the committee that if they need further detail or information on any subject that must be looked into for my nomination, I welcome the opportunity. However, the only caveat at this point that I have to let you be aware of is that as a candidate, for judicial office, I am constrained by the code of judicial conduct in talking about how I would decide any particular case or issue. And similarly, in my capacity as the disciplinary counsel, I am also constrained by the duty, of, uh, the duty to refrain from disclosing confidential uh, information. This includes the existence, non-existence of any matters, matter or matters before, or of any deliberations by the the ethics committees that I, I serve or answer to, unless the Supreme Court has already uh, imposed public discipline. In closing, there are never enough words nor enough time to fully demonstrate all that makes a person who and what he is, or how or why he or she would do what they would say or do. But please accept this testimony as a humble attempt to provide the members of this committee and the public the people of Guam in general, with a little insight into who I am as a person and as a lawyer, and uh, whether I am qualified in competence by temperament and life experience to be a member of the bench of the Superior Court. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ruiz. Now we have Attorney Tolentino, Judge Nominee, there's a whole list of names that are of people who are here out in the, the foyer of the Legisquam Congress building who are here in support of your nomination. So they've all signed in in support and uh, in addition to those who have given testimony. We can hear, just for those who are not here, we can hear them clapping from inside of this room. <laughs> we will proceed. I, so um, thank you for the testimony. I very much appreciate it and for your cooperation during the investigation stage of this and getting um, 
materials prepared so that the committee and the Guam legislature can do its due diligence in reviewing your nomination for the Superior Court of Guam. I know that in your uh, nomination packet that was submitted to us by the governor, you indicated that you have no financial interest in any business. And I want to just ask, um, does any of your family have any business interest that may pose a conflict for you if confirmed as a judge? The only one would be my wife's private business. She runs her own uh, uh, individual marriage family therapist business, and that was all of hers. Can you just tell us the status of your position as ethics prosecutor? Are you currently employed as the ethics prosecutor today? I am. I, I've held this position since June of 2018, and depending on the, uh, the outcome of the confirmation hearing and the, the, the consent of the, this body and voting will determine whether and when I leave. At the time that we asked for, um, you know, from the ethics prosecutor as to whether you had been disciplined, you are the ethics prosecutor, so I'm just it's an unusual circumstance, so I'm just going to ask it on the record. Have you ever been disciplined by the Ethics Committee as an attorney or under the Judicial Code of Conduct? As an attorney, I have not been disciplined uh, by the Ethics Committee. As a jurist, I will, for the committee's information, and I think they already know that, a uh, private admonition was issued uh, claiming or basically uh, indicating that they believed, the Committee on Judicial Discipline believed that uh, the rules of judicial conduct were violated by uh, uh, actions I took as a magistrate judge. Uh, they decided on a private admonition to dispose of the matter, um, and this occurred in 2016. In 2016, so subsequent to that, you were appointed to be the ethics prosecutor, is that right? Yes, I was. I wanted to ask a, a couple questions about competency. So we've heard testimony you know, regarding the, your different uh, areas of law that you've practiced in and, and uh, how you are a very quick learner and that uh, you're always very well prepared for your cases, but I'm just going to ask a couple questions. Um, have you ever practiced, we don't expect that judicial nominees have practiced in every field, but I just want to put this on the record. Have you ever practiced a procurement law? On the, on the procurement law, only my only experience had been when I was the Chief Deputy Attorney General for the AG's office and we had to deal with uh, procurement issues for the office, uh, but not, not to the extent of practicing. Have you been involved in any products liability cases? No. no. Class action? No. I'm picking some of the ones that I'm thinking are complex and um, just wanted to know, so in those types of cases where you've, you've not practiced in those areas, how would you explain how you intend to be competent to make a decision in those types of cases? Sure. All judicial officers have an obligation to be competent in the matters that are that you're presiding over. No judge ever knows everything about a case or about uh, uh, a matter that comes before it. Part of it is the education that you receive from the lawyers themselves as they're zealously but ethically advocating on the part of their clients. Part of it comes from your own research, from your law clerk and yourself, when you're, you're uh, trying to come up to speed on procedural, pro uh, procedural processes or actual substantive, substantive law. I enjoy the research aspect of it. I would always come up to speed uh, on cases when I was sitting as a magistrate on things that I had never seen before. Uh, going to the books, learning the procedure that's there, uh, asking around how people conducted these hearings or what was it that they looked for. And at the end of everything, 
what I ended up doing was deciding that I know enough of the issues to go forward. Parties, give me the argument for and against each side, all right? And, and let me decide where the, where the dispute is, where the issue is. And uh, I just wanted to make, I just want to make sure that each side has that opportunity uh, to do that. And that's how the best decisions or judgments from courts come down. As a magistrate judge, uh, you were responsible for deciding whether someone is released on certain occasions or not released. Mm -hmm. And some of the criteria was supposed to be whether they were a threat to the community in criminal cases. Do you believe magistrates are capable of making that determination or competent? And has, have you ever regretted any of your decisions as to threat to the community? Sure. One of the things that I, I guess never gets projected when people cover magistrate hearings, huh? first appearances of criminal defendants, is the law that the legislature has prescribed is criminal defendants, you get out unless, and then there's a list of factors that come down. It's been a struggle for, for judicial systems to try to deal with that because you may have a, a person who comes in before you for murder and it's the first murder, murder they ever did. From that, how do you know you're gonna be a threat to the community, you're gonna murder, murder other people? You know, I mean, it's, it's very difficult as a judge to come in on bare information just on the charges by itself. So as a magistrate, I relied a lot on reports that the probation office would give on the, the, the stability of where the defendant lives. If there were any comments or, or uh, reputation evidence about the, about the uh, alleged defendant, if there were people in the community who could sponsor that defendant as a third party custodian, um, and worse yet, which you're seeing now, nowadays, is the imposition of a cash bail. Cash bail is great if you have the money to post, but when you're poor and you don't have the money to post it, uh, you know, it, 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 sometimes people think of it as unfair. But that is the system I had when I was the magistrate, and so I would try to use the best information I could from whatever sources were available to go down the factors, to go down the list, and then come up with the decision whether or not this person uh, is going to come to further hearings and he's not at risk to uh, abscond from Guam or he's not at risk to injure other people. Uh, as a magistrate, were you sent to formal training? I, uh, I think it was in, I got appointed in um, uh, November of uh, 2009 and I went to the National Judicial College in Reno in, in uh, I think it was October or May the, the following year. Uh, in that particular matter that was uh, training for general jurisdiction judges and it gave you uh, wide exposure to how ju judges handle all sorts of matters, evidentiary matters, substantive law matters, um, sensitivity to, uh, to uh, clients who don't use English as a second language or who are self-representing themselves. Um, and, and, and it was a good uh, background and, and training to have, but they always required that you had at least six months of actual court time before you went to judge's school. I've gone back to the National Judicial College a couple of times uh, for further training. Uh, mostly on learning how to recognize when uh, particular parties are coming before you uh, in a, um, what's the term? They're representing themselves, but they don't have it all there, you know, uh, cognitively, how to address or be sensitive to those issues and how to help them through the process. Thank you. I have a, a couple more questions. I was going to go through the Judicial Code of Conduct and just ask, but I'm gonna right now yield to my colleagues and see what questions they have. Senator Taitikui. Sejus Masi, Madam Speaker. And um, many of the questions she asked, I mean, it's her line of work with attorneys, so 
I figured um, most of the questions I had, she actually asked. But I have to admit something, though. When I found out we were going to, um, early on, that there was going to be a nomination of Tolentino coming to be a judge, I really thought it was Rossi. <laughs> Sorry. I was like, oh, great, Rossi. <laughs> I know your brother, Rossi. I've known him for many, many years. Uh, we, we did a project together, and he's, he's a very good guy. So listening to him testify on your behalf was, was very touching and very, very, very sincere uh, from your brother. And of course, um, Mr. Uh, Attorney Espaldon, you know, sitting on the other side of you, it's like these two brothers, you know, there to support you. And that's a lot of times, you know, when you're going into something like this, it's mostly needed is family support especially the kind of job that uh, you're being nominated for. It's not easy, it can be very scary sometimes, and not just for yourself, but the family as well. So stepping up and doing something like this, um, I'm, I'm very um, taken with that because it takes a lot of guts and courage that what you're doing, you know. I uh, appreciate you wanting to serve our island in that capacity. Um, you know, you, you talked a lot about being a magistrate, and um, I was just wondering, as, as a judge, or when you were a magistrate judge, if you came upon any cases that you weren't sure needed to educate yourself more on, uh, would you seek the assistance from other judges, or just would you just stay in your corner, or how, how do you go about it? No doubt. I, I would think it would be important to get some information from your judges. Uh, what I found myself doing was actually doing the research myself. If there was an issue of law I did not know right off the top of my head, I, uh, I, did, my, I did my own writing and wrote my own decisions without the assistance of a law clerk. And uh, the, I have peers or mentors, I regard them as mentors, uh, other judges who I could always bounce off uh, questions and ideas uh, about certain cases or certain matters. I routinely went up to, to presiding Judge La Marina because uh, I considered him, even though I was uh, nominated and appointed by the Chief Justice, in the scheme of things, the, the uh, org chart, I'm supposed to answer to the, to the presiding. So I would bounce off issues uh, problems that come up uh, as a magistrate, as well as the other judges of the Superior Court. They, they all have been, you know, the judges that were there, have, there was a collegiality about, uh, about them. They are always willing to listen uh, to an issue and, and, and give you some, some wisdom and, mm -hmm. uh, and advice or, or hints on how to, to do your job. And on that one I learned a lot from those. Yeah. One thing I find very um, uh, pleasing to know is the fact that you, you came from an area where there's ethics, you know, morals, ethics, before coming into being a, um, now the next step, if, if so nominated, become a judge. I think that's very, very important when it comes to um, anything that you do or the decisions you make is in ethics. No matter, I mean, speaking about cases to other people, which is a no-no, and um, I just feel comfortable knowing that you were in that line of work before becoming a judge. You know, it's, I know you didn't get very popular <laughs> from what I hear from other <laughs> attorneys who was in a very popular job, but yeah. um, at least um, it's good to know. Thank you, Senator. The other one, and the reason why I'm veering in that direction is because like any branch of government or any sector of business or anything, there's always politics involved. You know, there's politics with lawyers, politics, you know, that happens at the judicial branch, politics here. And considering you were in, you know, uh, holding that position at the, as an ethics director, um, the politics that happens at the judicial branch, we hear about it all the time. So can you tell me what you will do in, in the event when you think that something is uh, morally and ethically uh, important to stand your ground, but you're getting pressure 
from other judges. How are you going to address that if ever it comes up? In my experience, uh, practicing law in front of the Superior Court, uh, there has only been one instance where I would hear of a, a, a true ethics violation of someone trying to, well, not really a violation yet, but someone trying to communicate ex parte with the judge about a current case that's there. Normally what would happen is the court's got to say that's against the, that's against the rules, both procedurally and under the rules of judicial conduct, because you're, you're getting information without the benefit of the other side being there knowing what that information is. And so, you know, I've never seen anyone being prosecuted by the, uh, any of the judges currently being prosecuted like that. It is, what happens normally is that in both the lawyer and the judicial system, you get a complaint against a judge or a lawyer. It's investigated in front of a probable cause type panel and it's determined whether or not there's merit to go forward in the process. In the judicial side, if there's merit to go forward, it's, it becomes public when formal charges are filed. For the lawyer disciplinary system right now, it's confidential unless and until the Supreme Court orders, uh, orders discipline. A lot of cases in the disciplinary realm are disposed of early on because Although it might be easy to state that there's an ethics matter or an, an ethics problem, when it comes time to actually seeing if a rule was actually violated, whether or not the purposes of the rules uh, is being vindicated when you're looking at the conduct, a lot of times you'll find that 90, 95% of them are not with merit. Okay, and, and so some judges or in some lawyers, if they, they have ethics complaints, they won't know about it until they start getting further investigations, you know, about it. And uh, uh, that's how issues of, of ethics are raised. So there is the opportunity that everything is confidential, so you're working towards trying to see if the facts, if they're true, is there an ethics violation? And then I'm getting guidance from the ethics committees that I appear in front of. And, uh, you know, that's how we... I do the investigation for any kind of allegation. That's what I expect with the system that's going to come in place come August 1st. We'll handle the investigations and, uh, uh, and I don't know how much more I can add. To well, can, put it this way. Can I rely on you that if you see anything unethical that you will report it? Yeah. It is our obligation as a judge, even as a lawyer, if you have actual knowledge of uh, an ethics violation or an actual knowledge of facts that indicate that this person is not fit to practice law, you have the obligation to report it to the disciplinary authority. Good to hear. So. I spent a, an hour uh, reading through all the documents that were brought forth on, on your nominations, all the uh, reports that were given, um, and uh, I, I wish you the very best. I think um, you're going to make a, a great judge. I think you'll, you'll do very well, and uh, you have great family to back you up, to support you, that the support you're going to need in taking on this position. I know you've been there as a magistrate judge, but like you said earlier, this is bigger. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so. But um, it's so. good to know that you have family there to help you through this. So uh, congratulations on your nomination and for everyone who was here testifying, thank you for taking the time out. Thank, thank you. you, Senator. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Brown. Madam Speaker, if I defer to my colleagues that arrived before me. I'll defer to my colleagues that arrived before All me. All right, thank you. Senator Moylan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Attorney Tolentino, you know, Sir. I, I've heard comments from attorneys. I've heard comments from Bar Associate, the Bar Association. I've read comments from the Chief Justice. I hear comments from your family. Uh, if I summarize some of the statements they use, are not statements, but the words they use, I recall uh, love of law, uh, kind, respectful, thoughtful, 
He has the wisdom. He's a role model. You can always count on him. He's honorable, he's humble, he's patient. So sometimes you, you hear it and sometimes you, you read it in writing, but I, we know each other. <laughs> You're married to my cousin. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I haven't heard anything different on the home front. And I think you probably exemplified some of these good traits that was explained by your colleagues and their professionalism when you asked my cousin Doris if you can go play golf. <laughs> so I may not know you as Jimmy Connor, but I, you have a good golf swing. You've invited me over for uh, some really good meals. So I think you're also living your dream of owning your own restaurant one time and you make some great rib roast. No, thank you for being a, a tester for my food. Yeah. I'd like to say also your testimony. Uh, it shows a lot of empathy and humility. And I liked how you talked about your growing up to understand that you have some uh, commitment to serve based on the life your father lived. So I appreciate that. So in a way, it's kind of humbling to sit in front of my, my friend here, my, my cousin also, and to have this opportunity as a senator. And uh, I'm sure I'm making the right decision based on the applause I heard from outside to exercise my duty. And I'm looking forward to confirming you for your nomination as the next judge for Guam. So, thank, thank you, Senator. And thank you. Uh, for stepping up to the plate. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, sir. sir. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Moreland. Senator Adda. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Speaker. Senator. Uh, Mr. Tolentino, uh, first, before I address you, I'd like to address your family. Thank you for being here and listening to the testimony that has been presented to this legislative body. Um, I've heard Mr. Tolentino on many occasions uh, invoke the blessings of God, mention family, and before any person comes to any great endeavor, those are always the two most important, God and family. The, I believe that when all these people came out to testify in your favor, I sat here looking at you and you had that deep sense of appreciation but at the same token so humbled that even you yourself came out and said that you know yes there's a lot of good but with any profession there's always uh, pros and cons or good and bad that comes out of every testimony right but still you remain humble in, in, in yourself and I truly appreciate that. Thank you, sir. I've worked with you and you've been, you've been very uh, upfront and uh, working in our working relation. The, the only questions I probably would have for you is, um, you, you've been a referee in the Superior Court, a magistrate. What do you, what do you believe, or perhaps maybe maybe three of the greatest challenges that's faced the, Supreme, the, the Superior Court, and how would you prioritize those challenges with your, probably your recommendations or solutions to address them? Thank you, thank you, Senator. One of the things that I've always, try, uh, always tried to do as a magistrate, as a judicial officer, I always thought the responsibility to do was to provide a forum that was, that was fair and impartial to the litigants who would come before me, that I would be able to, you know, because I saw a lot of like uh, pro se uh, uh, parties, you know, people who represented themselves, I thought it was our obligation to, to teach the parties about what's going on in the process. 
Why, what, what are they trying to do to assert their rights? Uh, what did the rules and the, pro and, the, and the regulations in the court say that you can do and how to present those? And, and then at the end, show them when you came up with an order that you really truly listened to what they had to tell you and that you considered what they had to tell you, but that in accordance with the law, this is how the law applies to the facts, that this is the decision I'm coming out with. And what that does, for me, it fulfills one of the main priorities is that people who come before the court and get a judgment, whatever it is, have to know that when they come to court, they had a fair and impartial hearing. They had a fair and impartial jurist sit before them and they, they argued their hearts out and put out their case and it was considered. And that any order that comes out, even if you lose, or, or especially if you win, but you will comply with the decision that comes out. That's what I've always thought the, the value of a, a court hearing would be. You get the parties to dispute, you decide their case, and you, you put it in such a way where even if they don't agree with the result, they will at least respect the fact that the process was fair and impartial. So anything, the three priorities you mentioned, anything that would have to do with making sure that the public understands uh, that the, the court is, is where you come and, and settle these disputes and, and that you can have trust and confidence in the process. Anything that accomplishes that uh, would be my priority. I, I can't think of any particular program that we could do, but just do our jobs right. Uh, thank you. Do, you. do you believe that the caseload that the judiciary has at this point in time that the judges are addressing those caseloads in a timely manner, or do you believe that they may be um, a little behind? What, what is your belief in, in, in the, uh, the judges uh, addressing caseloads that are given to them? Sure, I, I, you know, I don't day to day keep track of what, the other, what other judges are doing. All I see is what's in the newspaper and what I see in the court calendar. Um, one of the things, obviously, was the, the coronavirus and, and the disruption of the cases that the judges had to handle. Uh, people have to remember that uh, criminal cases have priority over civil cases. Well, that doesn't help you if you have a civil case and you're, you're waiting to, to get heard by a judge, but the court is closed because of corona, or once it's open, the, the criminal case is getting, uh, is getting priority. Uh, but from what I seen and, and seen on the calendar and read in the newspapers, uh, there is a backlog. You know, there is a huge caseload of uh, uh, people that were asserting their rights to a speedy trial, so they, 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 uh, they are really putting the pressure not only on the government but also on the court to, to have jury selection done as, as quickly as possible and still give the person a fair trial. Um, the other thing is, is that with the retirement of Judge Sokola, her calendar was huge. She took care of the adult drug court program and she also had a criminal calendar as well as a civil calendar that's going to have to be taken. What that has done is the two magistrates that I'm aware of, they're inundated not only with what they had to do before, but also with uh, the new stuff, that the Judge Sokola stuff until they can find a replacement for her. So. Uh, in, in that regard, I've seen uh, how uh, stressful it is because there, there are a lot of cases out there. Uh, I, I see you mentioned Judge Sokola again, and it was mentioned earlier that you know you have pretty big shoes to fill in Judge Sokola's absence now. And even though she probably wears a size five, size five in shoes and you wear a size 10, you still have big shoes to fill. So. Very much so. Yeah. Very much so. But I, I look forward to... Um, to your, your confirmation going on to the session floor, and I look forward to voting on your confirmation. Thank you for answering the call of the governor to step up to the plate. I know it's not easy. It's not gonna be easy on your family as well, but with this outpouring of support that you have from them, I believe that uh, it would make that process for you to make that decision and, you know, made that decision to come forward and, and still be there uh, easier, so. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that your family's here in full support of you. And 
I appreciate all of you. So thank you very thank much you, for being sir. here tonight. Thank you for all of those who presented testimony um, in, in your favor to uh, see, be a part of the bench of the Superior Court. Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ada. Senator Brown? Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and certainly uh, thank you also to Attorney Tolentino for being here for his confirmation. I know we've not had a chance to speak. Uh, this is my first opportunity in quite a number of years to deal with the appointment of um, a member to our court. Uh, over the years, I've had the opportunity to review a number of members of the Superior Court of Guam, and we're here for the confirmation of two of the current justices on the Supreme Court of Guam. In all fairness, uh, certainly I appreciate the testimony that's been provided by everyone that's shown up today, including your family, to, to support you in your nomination. But of course, your role, as you know, is a very important and very critical one because you will be in a position uh, essentially to cast judgment on the people that come before you in our community. And we certainly have an expectation uh, of our judges and our justices that uh, not only do you have the, the judicial temperament to serve in the capacity, but also that um, you're not in a position to be compromised because of the important position that you hold. I had the opportunity as other members of the committee to review other documents that were provided uh, for your confirmation and in all fairness uh, I do want to ask because it's it just simply is part of the process which I think needs to be public so that the members of our community that can have confidence in your appointment uh, to serve on the Superior Court of Guam. Uh, one of the things that we did review with regards to your your submittal was your financial uh, report uh, in response to the questions with regards to your current finances and I did want to ask you that question because of course that's important uh, in terms of where your current status is and, and also to ensure you're not in a position to be compromised or you're in a position of concern with regards to finances and in reviewing that uh, I did have to ask the question um, because of, of, of the report that was submitted, what is your current status financially? Because I was a bit concerned in looking at, at your finances as to where you are from what that report uh, presented. Never declared bankruptcy. Okay. I, would, I, would, I would say that my finances are just like anybody else's finances who, who is engaged in employment, has a family that they take care of and, and, and lives uh, with a mortgage and, and payments on, on multiple vehicles, and who is Antigua in a certain way, always wanting to be there for their children. Mm -hmm. Help them out, even though most of them now are adults, uh, there's still the opportunity and, and, uh, and the obligation sometimes, even if it, legally it's not there, that you want to help, uh, and family. So I would say that the state of, the financial state, uh, for me and my family is that of, uh, of everybody else, anybody else who earns an income, services loans, takes care of family, takes care of a household. And uh, we're not at any point even near saying, there's just no way I can do this or uh, I can't handle it anymore and I'll retreat to bankruptcy court or something like that. I, 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 don't, have, I don't have those anxieties. And I, like I testified before, if there are hardships, you, you, you just got to face it. I've dealt as a magistrate with collection clients, mm -hmm. and I know that pain, and I know that anxiety, but I always gave them hope that they can work through this. It's one of the things I learned from my wife, one step at a time, one day at a time, you know, but you have to start somewhere in, in dealing with it. I've never run away from having to deal uh, with, with uh, financial problems if I had them, okay? And, and, but I still would not say that my position now financially is, is any worse than any other family. Well, and the reason I ask is obviously, you know, in serving in your capacity, that you have a limit to what you earn versus perhaps going back into private practice. Uh, and maybe you could certainly earn more if you were in private practice than what you're currently earning. But it, I appreciate your response and your I, I just think it's important that that issue be addressed because it, it, you're the first person I've looked at that I've had to ask that question. I don't mean it in a negative way, but I think it's important um, for those of us here that sit on the committee and ultimately the members of the legislature and even more important, the public, uh, to have you answer that question publicly. 
One of the other questions that I wanted to ask you, I mean, we're human and we're imperfect, and there's this uh, expectation we have of members that serve the judiciary that they're above, you know, the, their expectations that they're above everyone else in terms of their ethics, their sense of responsibility, their moral compass, all those wonderful things that, that we, we value in our community. And yet, you know, the judiciary, because of the way it's set up, is, is certainly also shrouded by a cloak of secrecy. When allegations are made against a member of, of the bar, uh, against a judge, against a justice, so, you know, the allegations, if they become public, are public, uh, but the general public never knows one way or the other, even if there is no merit, as you mentioned, in some cases there might not be any merit, but that's never anything that's publicly relayed. And, it's a little different for the other two branches of government because if an accusation is made, whether it's true or not, I mean, we get tried in the court of public opinion and sometimes accused of being guilty uh, when there might be no merit to it simply because of the politics. And the judiciary has politics. I, I have to tell you, over the years, I was taken aback sometimes because uh, when you see the true sentiments come out sometimes from members and judges, uh, especially when there's internal fighting, and that has occurred at the judiciary. Uh, sometimes I think it's a little more beyond even sometimes what we do here. Uh, so I appreciate the question by, by Senator Tello with regards to that. But at what position does that put you in? Because you have, you obviously worked uh, with members of the judiciary, the certain, the judges, the justices, uh, that may have been your coworkers and, and certainly may have appointed you to positions that you have served in. Um, how do you differentiate when there are issues that may come up, uh, and there has one been in particular for a member of the uh, one justice in, in the last year and a half that's come forth? How do you deal with that? Because these are people you know, they're people you've worked with, they're people perhaps that you like, uh, and yet some very serious allegations can come forth. Uh, how do you differentiate between that? I mean, they may be an attorney that came here and testified in favor of your nomination and yet an issue comes up down the road because, you know, I mean, we're all human. How do you separate uh, how you may feel personally from how you may have to conduct yourself professionally? And, and how have you dealt with that over the years, including in your role as serving not once but twice in the capacity of an ethics prosecutor? It's hard. It, nobody wants what I do. It, it was hard. Mm -hmm. Back in 2000, when I, when I, when I was offered the job by uh, Justice Chief Justice Cruz, <laughs> there weren't any takers willing or are willing or, or volunteering to do the job. Uh, BJ knew that I was a, a criminal prosecutor before, and so he, he, he put that trust and confidence in me to be able to, to um, administer the, the lawyer disciplinary uh, system. The, the good thing about it is that uh, you know my social circle is not that big right so but I do have a lot of friends and colleagues acquaintances and stuff like that and what I've always tried to do is I'm as straight up as it comes when it comes to my role as an ethics uh, disciplinary counsel I have prosecuted and I have seen the, the, the disbarment of a really good friend I've had to deal with the pain and and I guess guilt but that, that, that I felt that because this guy needed help, but he wasn't answering, he wasn't helping me help him, you know, navigate the system. And, and, and what, I, what I rely on and how I keep my head straight is there is a process. The process is there to ferret out uh, unsubstantiated claims, and if there are substantiated claims, to see how you can protect the public further okay, by either imposing or letting people know that, hey, this lawyer might be an issue, might be a problem, and he deserves to be dismissed from the practice of law or suspended from the practice of law or some other way, you know. Uh, it's the process that I rely on and the rules. I will never, I always tell whoever is before me, friend or not friend, you know, that I, there's no, emotion behind what I'm doing. That's how I separate myself. We're following the process. It says, assume everything you're complaining is telling you is true. If I do that, a hey, uh, attorney, it looks like there's a violation. You know, let me know what your side of the story is so I can communicate that to the ethics committee. And, and that's what I do. And, de and depending on what the ethics committee tells me to do or not to do, 
is, is, is how I know that everything I'm doing is above board and with the knowledge of other people who are overseeing my, my work. Um, when it comes to judges, I, when, when I was the first time, when I was the ethics prosecutor the first time, I, there was no judicial disciplinary system. It was only after Chief Justice Carbolito got the Guam Rules of Judicial Disciplinary Enforcement going that uh, we developed this process. And so I didn't become a, a judicial uh, disciplinary officer until I came back in June of 2018. And I was scared the crap out of me because if I ever quit the court, I'd never be able to practice in front of another judge if I investigated them, nor will any of my other lawyers want to practice with me because you know, they're, they're, I'm their ethics prosecutor. But I've always tried to maintain my objectivity within the rules that I, 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 I operate in and, and being as straight up and as fair to the alleged, uh, you know, the alleged uh, violator. That's how I've dealt with it personally. It's not personal, it's professional. I, I guess that's a, a line from the Godfather. You know, it's, it's, it's not personal, it's business. And, I, we uh, have to remember that line. <laughs> it, it's, it's not personal, it's professional. But now I see why co they call us sharks, because you know, we're out there policing our own. And, uh, but you know, the reason it's confidential is because the, the chance of losing or getting client confidences out in public while you're litigating this is probably worse than, than keeping it you know, in a closed system until there is uh, formal charges being brought and a formal disposition. I also want to ask you, because you know, sometimes we wonder, do, do we find our calling in life or does our calling find us? And you, you started your, uh, your testimony with relaying that you initially were pursuing perhaps uh, in the medical field and determined that that was not your calling. And, and here you are all these years later. And I just wanted to ask you, uh, just directly in your own position, why do you think you're qualified for this job? Unlike most, I guess it would be fair to say, like unlike most uh, nominees that have come before the court, uh, they, they're usually coming from private practice, you know, before. They've never been a judicial officer. I have had the, the blessing and the opportunity to have seen and be a judicial officer and see uh, how the court operates. and. From that experience and, and, and that outlook, uh, I think I bring to the judiciary a judge who can come in without much downtime at all and take over a huge caseload that's currently being distributed among three judges without skipping a beat. And at this particular stage in my career and my experience, both as a private practitioner, as a government attorney, and as a jurist, I can step in and 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 relieve or alleviate the, the problem of over, overcrowding or uh, the backlog in, in, of, of cases. Well, I appreciate your response. I mean, public service sometimes can be very thankless and uh, the fact that you're willing to step up to the plate and your nomination here today and, and I appreciate your candor in responding to our questions that we have certainly you know, there are moments in your life I know we all look upon as, as, as critical moments, important moments that we can reflect upon. I'm sure in your own life with your family, birth of your children, when you graduated from law school, you know, there's these key moments in your life and certainly today is one of them. Uh, and it's not every day you, you have everyone uh, that you know that desires professionally to come forth and provide testimony on your behalf and hear what their thoughts are of you. Uh, fortunately, today they're all very good. Uh, you know, we all aspire to that, and uh, I wish you well. I, I think it, it's a tough job that you're, you're setting out to do, but there's definitely a need in the community, and there's need for that level of commitment and public service. So I certainly wish you well in your, your continued you, venture down this road, and I'm sure it's a very proud moment for your family. And these are the good things. We don't always have good moments here in the session hall and the public hearing room, and um, it's certainly good to hear the testimony that's been provided today for your nomination. And as I said, I do wish you well on your new journey. With that, Madam Speaker, thank you very much for the opportunity to ask these questions of the nominee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Brown. Attorney Tolentino, as a member of the judiciary, you're also um, 
you know, it's another branch of government, independent, but are you willing to contribute to the, you know, leadership of the judiciary, the management, the administration, and ensuring that the judiciary is going to, you know, use taxpayer funds prudently and, and I guess when maybe that's what they mean by politics, I'm not sure, but are, you know, are you, how do you feel about that type of uh, role? I, I believe that, uh, well, we all know the Judicial Council exists to administer the court and, and their, their administrator of the court's uh, responsibility to uh, the overall operation of the court, the Supreme Court also as the, uh, the uh, court of first appeal or right of appeal. Uh, for individuals, that whole that whole operation of the branch, a, a branch of government, you know, presumes that it has the trust and confidence of the public, uh, first and foremost. I believe that all the jurists that are currently on the bench, those that are able to be in a management position, are trying their hardest you know, to, to not only provide the services to the people of Guam, but also to take care of the hundreds of employees of the judicial branch, as well as the thousands of, of people in the public wanting to utilize their services. So I, I, I you know, I understand that, that politics gets played because they're always trying to get extra money for their branch or, you know, in that regard. I would always hope that it was, it's because they're trying to benefit the branch and um, unless I, I know or see of something otherwise, you know, something more nefarious, you know, that's what I, that's how I see this particular uh, branch right now. Thank you. I, I would like to just, um, if you would bear with me, there are five canons of judicial conduct. And I, I would just like to go through these uh, partly as an educational process for those who are listening to understand really the commitment that you are making in becoming a judge and the part sacrifice that you are making and really the, um, the promise also that you are making in becoming a judge. And uh, so if you will bear with me, the first canon is a judge shall uphold the integrity and independence of the judiciary. An independent and honorable judiciary is indispensable to justice in our society. A judge should participate in establishing, maintaining, and enforcing high standards of conduct and shall personally observe those standards so that the integrity and independence of the judiciary will be preserved. Canon two, a judge shall avoid impropriety and the appearance of impropriety in all of the judge's activities. A judge shall respect and comply with the law and shall act at all times in a manner that promotes public confidence in the integrity and impartiality of the judiciary. A judge shall not allow family, social, political, or other relationships to influence the judge's judicial conduct or judgment. A judge shall not lend the prestige of judicial office to advance the private interests of the judge or others nor shall a judge convey or permit others to convey the impression that they are in a special position to influence the judge. A judge shall not testify voluntarily as a character witness. A judge shall not hold membership in any organization that practices invidious discrimination on the basis of race, sex, religion, or national origin. Canon three. A judge shall perform the duties of judicial office impartially and diligently. The judicial duties of a judge take precedence over all the judge's other activities. Judicial duties include all the duties of the judge's office prescribed by law. In the performance of these duties, the following standards apply. A judge shall hear and decide matters assigned. That's why I was kind of asking you about competence because we can't predict at this point which matters you will be assigned as a judge and you have to, it seems, take what you are assigned, take what you get. And, um, and 
Well, if, if you'd like me to expound a little bit on that, just, uh, sure. just briefly, I mean, uh, you as an attorney would know that the, the common thread to everything that we're doing in front of the court are the rules of procedure, criminal or civil. The, uh, the rules that dictate when complaints uh, get filed, what you have to do when those complaints are filed. The, the specifics on the area of law differ from complaint, complaint, or case to case. And given, given the breadth of experience that I have, limited in some areas that it might be, every person, lawyer or judge, has the duty to be competent in the field. And, and so if that means relying on your, your law clerk to, to give you some more information, doing your own research, hearing from the parties themselves, their inter interpretation, that's all part of, of gaining confidence in it. It's when you learn all that and disregard it and do your own thing that these canons are implicated because you are not giving someone the due process of listening to their arguments and, and, and applying the law dispassionately. Uh, and, and so if, if that kind of explained my position on that competence issue, a little better. I, ho I hope it does. Yes, no, I, um, the, even the first time, was convinced that uh, that is what I'm looking for in a judge, that uh, yes, we don't expect any judge to know anything walking in, but we expect them to, you know, um, to handle justice the way that you have described, by being informed, doing research, and, and hearing from both sides, most especially. That is the way our system is set up. Thank you. Um, a judge shall be faithful to the law and maintain professional competence in it. A judge shall not be swayed by partisan interests, public clamor, or fear of criticism. Do you feel that you would feel any pressure from the public as, as a sitting judge? We, we do here, for no, sure. No, I, I <laughs> That's why control, I'm asking. <laughs> I can't control what other people are, are going to say about any particular issue. You know, all I have is what I have in front of me, uh, the law, the parties, or whatever. Our obligation as, as jurists is to focus only on that. That's, that's our world, and, and the decisions that we make uh, are made in that context and should be done irregard irregardless is not a word, but irrespective of, of, of public uh, uh, criticism or public praise. You're just doing what the law says is supposed to be done. This one, uh, a judge shall require order and decorum in proceedings. A judge shall be patient, dignified and courteous to litigants, jurors, witnesses, lawyers, and others with whom the judge deals in an official capacity and shall require similar conduct of lawyers and staff, court officials, and others. This is what we've heard tonight very much. I think it's very clear that this is the, dis your disposition that has been described to us. So I'm very grateful that everyone has testified to this. And I myself, in the capacity that I have known you over the years, I, I can agree. So I'm very glad. Thank you. Um, a judge shall perform judicial duties without bias or prejudice, shall not, in the performance of judicial duties, by words or conduct, manifest bias or prejudice, including but not limited to bias or prejudice based upon race, sex, religion, national origin, disability, age, sexual orientation, or social economic status, and shall not permit staff, court officials, and others to do so. A judge must perform, a judge who manifests bias on any basis in a proceeding impairs the fairness of the proceeding and brings the judiciary on to disrepute. A judge shall require lawyers to refrain from manifesting bias. A judge shall accord to every person who has a legal interest in a proceeding or that person's lawyer the right to be heard according to law. 
A judge may obtain the advice of a disinterested expert on the law applicable to a proceeding before the judge if the judge gives notice to the parties of the person consulted and the substance of the advice and affords the parties reasonable opportunity to respond. A judge may consult with court personnel whose function it is to aid the judge. With the consent of the parties, may confer separately with the parties and their lawyers may initiate or consider any ex parte communication when expressly authorized by law. An appropriate and often desirable procedure for a court to obtain the advice of a disinterested expert on legal issues is to invite the expert to file a brief amicus curiae. That's in the commentary. A judge shall dispose of all judicial matters promptly, efficiently, and fairly. And we heard some questions regarding the timeliness of actions at the court. A judge shall not, while a proceeding is pending or impending in any court, make any public comment that might reasonably be expected to affect its outcome or impair its fairness, or make any non-public comment that might substantially interfere with a fair trial or hearing. A judge shall not, with respect to cases, controversies, or issues that are likely to come before the court, make pledges, promises, or commitments that are inconsistent with the impartial performance of the adjudication duties of this office. This is in the commentary as well. Restrictions on judicial speech are essential to the maintenance of the integrity, impartiality, and independence of the judiciary. A pending proceeding is one that has not begun, but that has begun, but not yet reached final disposition. An impending proceeding is one that is anticipated, but not yet begun. The requirement that judges abstain from public comment regarding a pending or impending proceeding continues during any appellate process and until final disposition. A judge shall not commend or criticize jurors for their verdict. Judge shall not disclose or use for any purpose unrelated to judicial duties non-public information acquired in a judicial capacity. Administrative responsibilities uh, sh shall discharge responsibilities without bias or prejudice, maintain professional competence in judicial administration, cooperate with other judges and court officials in the administration of court business. If with supervisory authority for judicial performance of other judges, shall take reasonable measures to assure prompt disposition of matters. Shall not make unnecessary appointments, uh, the exercise and the power of appointments impartially and on a basis of merit. Disciplinary responsibilities. A judge who receives information indicating a substantial likelihood that another judge has committed a violation of this code should take appropriate action. A judge having knowledge that another judge has committed a violation of this code that raises a substantial question as to the other judge's fitness for office shall inform the appropriate authority. The same applies to information that you receive as to lawyers. A judge shall disqualify himself in a proceeding in which his impartiality might reasonably be questioned, including where the judge has a personal bias or prejudice concerning a party or a party's lawyer or personal knowledge of disputed evidentiary facts if the judge served as a lawyer in the matter in controversy. The judge knows that he or she individually or as a fiduciary or the judge's spouse, parent or child wherever residing or any other member of the judge's family residing in the judge's household has an economic interest in the subject matter in controversy. The judge knows or learns by means of a timely motion that party or party's lawyer has within the previous year made an aggregate contribution to the judge's campaign. Judge shall keep informed about the judge's personal and fiduciary economic interests and a reasonable effort to keep informed about the personal economic interests of the judge's spouse and minor children residing in the judge's household. Canon four, a judge shall so conduct the judges extrajudicial activities as to minimize the risk of conflict with judicial obligations. This is why I call the sacrifice, because it affects all your, your whole life. Judge shall conduct all of the judges extrajudicial 
judicial activity so that they do not cast reasonable doubt on the judge's capacity to act impartially as a judge. They do not demean the judicial office, do not interfere with the proper performance of judicial duties. A judge may speak, write, lecture, teach, and participate in other extrajudicial activities concerning the law, the legal system, the administration of justice and non-legal subjects subject to requirements of this code. A judge shall not appear at a public hearing before or otherwise consult with an executive or legislative body or official except on matters concerning the law, the legal system or the administration of justice or except when acting pro se in a matter involving the judge or the judge's interests. A judge shall not accept appointment to a governmental committee or commissions that is concerned with issues of fact or policy on matters other than the improvement of the law, the legal system, or the administration of justice. A judge may serve as an officer, trust, director, trustee, or non-legal advisor of an organization or governmental agency devoted to improvement of the law and the legal system shall not serve as an officer director of an organization that if it's likely the organization will be engaged in proceedings that would ordinarily come before the judge. Judge um, as an officer or as a member may assist an organization in planning fundraising and may participate in the management and investment of organization's funds but shall not personally participate in the solicitation of funds or other fundraising activities except that they may solicit funds from other judges over whom the judge does not exercise supervisory or appellate authority. Financial activities, judge shall not engage in financial and business dealings that may reasonably be perceived to exploit the judge's judicial position or involve the judge in frequent transactions or continuing business relationship with those lawyers or other persons likely to come before the court on which the judge serves. Judge may, subject to requirements, hold and manage investments of the judge and members of the judge's families, including real estate and engagement in remunerative activity. A judge shall not serve as an officer of any business entity, except that a judge may, subject to the requirements, uh, participate in a business closely held by the judge or members of the judge's family or a business entity primarily engaged in investment of the financial resources of the judge or members of the judge's family. A judge shall manage the judge's investments to minimize the number of cases in which the judge is disqualified. Judge shall not accept and shall urge members of the fam family residing in the judge's household not to accept a gift, bequest, favor, or loan from anyone, except for a gift incident to a public testimonial, books, tapes, and other resource materials supplied by publishers on a complimentary basis, or an invitation to the judge and the judge's spouse or guest to attend a bar-related function or activity devoted to the improvement of the bar, the legal system, or the administration of justice. Shall not accept a gift, award, or benefit incident to the business, profession, or other separativity of a spouse or other family member of a judge residing in the house, including gifts, awards, and benefits for the use of, of both. May accept social, ordinary social hospitality, a gift from a relative or friend for a special occasion such as a wedding, anniversary, or birthday. And there are other gift rules, scholarships, and other things. I'm, I won't read all of those. Um, shall not serve as an executor, administrator, or other personal representative except for the estate, trust, or person of a member of the judge's family, and then only if such service will not interfere with the proper performance of judicial duties shall not serve as a mediator or arbitrator, shall not practice law. This is a, a big one, I guess. Uh, sure. Shall not practice law. Uh, a judge may act pro se and may without compensation give legal advice to and draft or review documents for a member of the judge's family. They talk about compensation and reporting and disclosure of income and debts. 
And then canon number five, the, the last canon. A judge or judicial candidate shall refrain from inappropriate political activity. A judge shall not act as a leader or hold an office in a political organization, publicly endorse or publicly oppose another candidate for public office, make speeches on behalf of a political organization, attend political gatherings, solicit funds for, or make a contribution to a political organization or candidate, or purchase tickets for political party dinners or other functions. shall not, with respect to cases, controversies, or issues that are likely to come before the court, make pledges, promises, or commitments that are inconsistent with the impartial performance of the adjudicative duties of the office, knowingly misrepresent the identity, qualifications, present position, or other fact concerning a candidate or opponent. And this is also, uh, these apply in judicial race, um, judicial elections as well. So sure. we know that here on Guam, we, we reconfirm our judges every seven years in the Superior Court, I think. Right. And so, yeah, just wanted to um, read those because you, you are making a huge commitment and you were making a promise to the people of Guam. And um, you are also, uh, I think, uh, you know, I want them also to know what it is that you've had to commit to and that, uh, you know, we can expect from you and all our judges. And so I personally want to thank you again for, and your family for all that you've done uh, to date. I think you have a, a very commendable career, commendable reputation. Um, I know as a lawyer that um, I personally have, have um, yeah, just uh, high regard. I've not had any reason to uh, or hear any negative, and so um, I'm happy to be the one to be here today to help to get your confirmation. Um, process through the Guam legislature, and we hope for a speedy confirmation as soon as we're back in session. And um, we are, again, if there's any information that is, comes up in between this hearing and that confirmation hearing, we hope that you can uh, disclose that to us as well. We have put in an inquiry to the Supreme Court as to whether there is any, any pending investigation uh, we know that there's no discipline. They've answered that there is no discipline that they that has been filed at the Supreme Court. And um, with that, again, congratulations, and we wish you the best. Uh, if you are confirmed, we wish you the best in this position in serving the people of Guam. And thank you for your 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 real um, public service attitude all these years and your commitment. Uh, I very much appreciate it. I don't think it's easy to go work in the Attorney General's office for years and especially to be a prosecutor, to, yeah, to serve in an administrative capacity there as well. Like you said, it's the largest law firm on Guam and, I, and I'm very grateful that you have been able to serve as a magistrate and um, ethics prosecutor uh, with fairness and that, that's been the testimony tonight. So. Thank you very Susan. much, Madam Speaker. Thank you Members of the committee, thank you so much. Be safe. That this um, confirmation hearing will now conclude. Uh, members who were not able to present testimony may continue to present testimony uh, to my office at Senator Terlahi Guam for the next five days. It's now 7.20 p.m. and this this committee is adjourned. See you this morning.